So we need to check our hearts. Make sure they're not follow ground. Make sure they're not hardened. You know, there's a lot of stuff in this world to draw us away from God. Are we turning our back on God? Are we turning to little idols? You know, we have eyes, we have ears. We can see what is going on in our world today. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 4 tonight. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll go ahead and jump right into it because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So let's pray. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we come before you today, uh, God, thanking you, uh, as always, for your word, Lord, thanking you that, Father, as we listen to to what your prophets had to say uh, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, Lord, how can that pertain not only to, to your people, Lord, but to us today? And Father, as we go through your word, Lord, as we, we see Jeremiah coming through and, and preaching the judgment that is coming, the destruction that is coming, Lord, um, for their unrepented hearts, Lord, but we see also how merciful, how graceful, God, you are not only to them back then, Lord, but to us today, Lord. So we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the gift of history that as we look back, God, we can try to not repeat these same mistakes in our lives today, Lord. So I pray that you just fill this room with your spirit, Lord, that that it'll be your words that we all hear, your words that will edify our hearts, Lord. They will penetrate, Lord, that we can bear fruitful soil unto you, Lord. We thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So so last week, we we started in chapter 3. We went through chapter 2 and 3, and went all the way to chapter 4, and we did verse 1 and 2, but I'm going to read those real quick, and then we'll see, because as we were going through chapter 3, the Lord was talking about his people and all of their, their backsliding, and he was talking to, to Israel, a land that had already been conquered. They had already been overrun, but he was telling them, you know, if you would repent, you know, we hear that word so much today, to repent. If they would repent and turn from their sins, that he told them that, that he would cause his anger not to fall on them. And he told them that he would begin to heal them and bring them back into their land. And as we started, uh, verse 1 and 2 in chapter 4, it said that, If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. And he was telling me, you know, if you return to me, if you take all these wicked idols that you're, that you're worshiping, that you're following, that you're doing all these abominations in my sight and turn to me, then you shall not be moved. So it's so good to see that, you know, even when we are stuck in our sin, even if we are far from God, he's telling the people that if you come to me, you know, I will make it where you shall not be moved. So now today when we're going to drop down that Jeremiah is going to be talking to the men and the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem. And, you know, this book is a hard book. You know, this is a book of a prophet that's coming in, and he's teaching a message to people that, you know, judgment is coming. Destruction is coming upon you, and, you know, nobody's listening to him. We're going to see today where he's got not only Jeremiah going out, but there's false prophets preaching that, you know, there's going to be peace coming, and Nobody wants to listen to poor Jeremiah. But he says in verse 3, it says, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow grounds, and do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart. You men of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doing. So now we see right at the beginning, he says that he's talking to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, and he's telling them to to break up your fallow ground. I don't think that's a word that we use a lot in our day-to-day language, unless any of you guys are gardeners or farmers. Do we have any farmers out here that know what, what fallow ground is? Not really, no? Okay. So the follow ground, say, say you had your field, you went out and you plowed it, you grew some crops for a couple years, and then maybe you decide, you know what, I'm going to take a vacation, you go and travel for a while, you're gone for a year or so, or you just get busy with life and you're not 
taking care of the ground. So you just kind of let it go dormant, and it's sitting there. You know, if you had tilled ground, it's been nice and smooth, and after a while, it, you know, it starts to get weeds growing in there. The dirt starts to get hardened. So he's saying, you know, break up that fallow ground. This ground that became hard, it was once used for good crops. It was once used for good fruit. He's saying, go in there, till it up, as it was with your heart. And as you go in there and you till this up, you want it to be soft ground. You want to have gentle ground. I was, I was reading it. It kind of reminds you in Matthew 13 when Jesus was doing the parable of the sowers. You know, he's talking to them out in, the, out in the wilderness. He probably sees some farmers in the back. And, you know, he's saying, you just cast out your seeds. So as you're throwing out your seeds, he says, some of them are going to land on the wayside. You know, the hard ground. Some of them are going to land on stony ground. Some of them are going to land in amongst the thorns, and some of them land on good ground. And as you're out there planting them, you know, you don't, nowadays, we don't just go out and throw seeds everywhere. You know, we, we till it, we get it all nice and pretty, we put the seeds in in order so that if you're growing corn, it grows in rows, or whatever vegetables and stuff you're growing, you got it nice and orderly so when it grows and sprouts, you know what it is. So here he is saying, you know, I want you to take your hearts and break up that hard ground, and don't sow among the, the thorns. He, you know, the Bible says that when that parable said of the, the thorny ground is that when the stuff props out, the thorns suck it down and kill it. So he wants it to be in the good ground. And then in verse 4, he tells them to circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. And as Jeremiah is telling this to the people of Judah, they're all, all the men will be like, well, you know what? I am, I'm already circumcised. What do you mean by circumcise your heart. He's like, I've been circumcised. You know, it was tradition that everybody, when they were a baby, they're getting circumcised. But he's like, no, your heart. You know, God sees what's on the inside. We may have our flesh looking good. We may show up to church, you know, in our, in our Sunday best or our Wednesday night casual, however we come. But he's not looking at, okay, you're checking the box of coming to church. You're checking the box of doing all these religiosity things that the people of Judah thought that, you know, we're from Jerusalem. We have the temple right here that we're God's chosen people. And he's telling them, you need to remove your calloused heart, the fallow ground. You need to soften it up, tenderize it, and come back to me. So he gave them the instructions and warnings that if they do not do this, at the second half of verse 4, it says, Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil that you're doing. You know, he's looking at his people. He's seeing all the evil, the abominations that they're doing. And he's telling him, if you don't do these things, I'm telling you what to do. But if you don't do these things, there's going to be a fire coming down on you that nobody can quench. And then in verse 5, he says, Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from the thicket, and the destroyer of the nations is on his way. He has gone forth from place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament, and will. And for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. So if you were to go back to Jerusalem, if you go back to, to that time, there would be a few different things they would do with the trumpet. You know, they blow the trumpet when it's time for celebration. Oh, it's party time. Let's gather all the people. Let's come to the feast. But there would also be blowing the trumpet during a warning. If we have somebody coming to invade the land, if there's something that they needed to gather the people they didn't have a cell phone like we did where we could pull it out and text everybody and say, hey, look, such and such is going to happen. You know, they needed something loud, something that's going to get the people's attention. So they would blow their horn or, you know, the, the Sephora, the, 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 the ram's horn. I think we have one out in one of the cases if you wanted to see what it was, because not everybody had the metal to get a trumpet or create a horn. But, you know, they would blow it. And this time it was blowing it to let them know that they have people coming down to attack them. They had this horn to blow it, gather around, to be known that something was coming up. And it says, assemble yourselves. 
and let us go into the fortified cities. The fortified cities, when you were back in those days, you know, you hear the stories of Jericho, where God told the people to, to march around the walls seven times, and then at the end, they, they blew their horns, they shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. When the spies went into the land and they met Rahab, she hit them in the walls of the city and let them out. You know, the fortified walls were what protected the people that were inside the city. So he's telling them that, you know, you need to gather yourselves and then run and hide in the fortified cities to try to protect yourself. But it says that as you do this, let up a standard towards Zion. Take refuge and do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and a great destruction. We already know from the beginning that it says that Babylon is the one that's going to come and take them over. And if you look at your map, it's over to the east, but when you see the big, vast desert that is in between them, as they come through, they're coming through the north. And we're going to see when we get to chapter 5 that the city of Dan, the top part of Israel, if you've ever gone to travel to to Israel, it's so beautiful up in that area. You know, you come down to Jerusalem, which, you know, it's so great. They got the temple, they got everything else, but it's all modernized. It's all city, but you get up north, you go by Galilee, and it, it's just beautiful there. Like Pastor Terry was saying this Sunday that it, it feels like home. You know, it's more wilderness, it's more open, it's not as populated as Jerusalem. So as they coming down, he says, you know, they're going to be coming down from the north, for great destruction. And then in verse 7, it says that the lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the nation is on his way. He's gone forth from his place. Um, a lot of commentators, when you read it, it says that lion that's coming up from his thicket. You think about a lion. If you watch National Geographic, maybe you go to the zoo. I went to the zoo with my wife a couple weeks ago, and, and the lions here are pretty chill. You know, you watch them out there, and they're just hanging out in the sun, wishing that they were in some place that was a little bit warmer. But when a lion is going out somewhere, you know, you hear him roaring. And a lion, they, they travel in a pack. You know, they have a pride of lions, and you'll have one of them over here roaring, making all this noise for whatever the prey is or whatever will be taken off running. But little do they know they have somebody in wait to ambush the little deer or whatever it is that they're, they're chasing. But he's telling them, you know, that the lions are hanging there waiting, just like Nebuchadnezzar is roaring. He is a tearing lion coming down from Babylon to tear them apart. And he tells them in verse 8, Close yourself with sackcloth, lament, and well. Here, Jeremiah pictured God's people repenting finally. You know, back in those days when you see them coming down, they would, they would do a lot of physical stuff. They'd take their clothes off. They'd cover themselves with ashes. They would put sackcloth on. I don't know, out here it'd probably be called like a gunny sack material. I don't know if that's what you would want to wear underneath your clothes because it's, it's all rough. You know, here they're trying to do an outward thing for something that they were trying to do inward. As they were repenting, they would wear rough clothes on and let them remind them, you know, we did something wrong. We're turning to God to, because we're in all of this anguish. So they would wear the sackcloth and then they would cry out to God. But it was a little too late. In verse 9, it says, And we shall come to pass in this day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. You know, it says, The heart of the king shall perish. When the ter terrible judgment comes, even the nobility, the kings will lose their courage. The priests will be astonished. You know, we got all these false prophets that we're going to be reading about that are, that are preaching that peace. You know, Jeremiah is over here saying all this judgment's going, but we're God's chosen people. We got the temple. We're here in, in Judea, in Judah, that nothing is going to happen to us. But even them, when they come down, they will be astonished because they didn't return to the Lord. They didn't break up the follow ground that was in their heart, and they didn't circumcise their heart to the answer of God's invitation. And as he's preaching this judgment, we get to verse 10, and then he says, this is Jeremiah, says, Ah, oh, Lord, surely you have greatly deceived this people of Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches the heart. You know, you could see Jeremiah. He's out here telling all the people that, hey, all this gloom and doom and stuff is coming up. But he's like, wait a minute. I heard you were talking about peace, God. He's like, how are we telling all these people we have all of this 
if we were told that we should have peace. It's almost like a little sidebar conversation in the middle of preaching to these people in Judah that, hey, you know, you need to circumcise your heart. You need to break up the hardness of your heart. And he's like, wait a minute, what is all this judgment you're talking about? And Jeremiah wondered if God was not greatly deceiving his people when he promised you shall have peace. But seemingly, God promised peace to his people when an astounding judgment was coming upon them. But it wasn't the Lord who promised peace. It was the false prophets who claimed to speak in his name. You know, there's one other time where this phrase is used, you shall have peace. And it's actually found later on in Jeremiah chapter 23. We don't have to turn there right now. I'll go ahead and read it to you. But these were the words that came out of the false prophets who prophesied peace to those who despise the Lord. So throughout Jeremiah, we're going to see all these false prophets complaining and proclaiming the opposite of what Jeremiah said. You're like, we're God's chosen people. We don't have to worry about anything. We can do what we want because God loves us. He's chosen us. He's brought us in to this land, and he's not going to bring judgment on us. But we know that we can't mock God. God is not one to be mocked. In verse 11, he says, At that time it will be said, And to the people and to Jerusalem, A dry wind of desolate heights blows in the wilderness towards the daughter of my people. Not to fan or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come from me. Now I will also speak judgment against them. So here, Judge Jeremiah, he goes from his little sidebar conversation with God and then he's coming back to him and saying that, you know what? Judgment is coming. And he said that God is going to send a wind that destroys. Not a wind that is a cool wind. You know, I grew up in Southern California. It gets hot. But the good thing about California, in, in the Southern half at least, is that every night you can count on this breeze coming through. You know, it may be 100 degrees at night, but the sun's coming down. The breeze starts coming in. It cools you off and it drastically cooled down. But this is not the type of wind that we're reading about right here. God says that he's going to bring a wind that is coming from the wilderness, a dry wind, a desolate wind. Throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, we hear about when they would need to go to the threshing floor. And if you guys aren't familiar with the threshing floor, is they, would, they would gather all of, all of the wheat, all of the stuff from the field, and they would take it out into a big maybe 150 square feet or so area, and they get their little pick fork, and they're throwing it up in the air. And the wind would come by, a light wind, to blow it. It would separate the chaff, which is light, which would fly away, and then the grain would fall down to the ground. So after they're you know, spending a couple hours in the cool of the night, going through all of their stuff, they can come down and gather all their grain, and all of the trash have flown away. And God's saying, I'm going to come and bring this heat wave Dry heat that's going to destroy all of your stuff. He's like, it's more of a judgment. It's a wind too strong in verse 12. A wind too strong for these will come from me. And now I will also speak judgment against him. So this wind is not something that, you know, we think of wind being light and flesh and refreshing. And God's telling him, no, this is going to be a hot, scorching, dry heat where they could get no relief. And then in verse 13, it says, behold. We shall come up like clouds and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. You know, God's even telling them that this judgment is coming. When, when Jeremiah wrote this section, it was probably 20 years later before Babylon came in and actually took them over. So here he is, you know, the same can be said in our world today. You know, we all come back, you know, Jesus is coming back. You know, we read the Bible and it says Jesus is coming back. But then we look back. It's been 2,000 years since he died on that cross. It's like, well, when is he coming back? You know, here we are as believers knowing and anticipatingly waiting for that day when people are out there mocking. He's like, you know, you say all of these things are going to happen, but where is your God? Look at this world around you. Where is your God? When is he coming back? And he's telling them that this judgment it's going to come like that. It's going to come quickly. He says, Behold, he shall come up like the clouds, and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. You know, the in, he's giving them the instruments that are coming. Chariots like eagles, chariots of a whirlwind, their skies, their chariots fast, and their horses that are faster than 
eagle, letting them know that when this comes, it's coming like a whirlwind. You're not even going to have any time to react to it. And in verse 14, he says, O Jerusalem, wash your feet from the wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make a mention to the nations. Yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around because she has rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things to you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. The wickedness in the hearts of people of Judah brought a threat of God's judgment, but it wasn't a heart problem. It was also a, a mind problem. They were stuck with their evil thoughts. They indulged in them. They allowed them to, to lodge in their mind. These thoughts were, were wedged. It said that they were like, they were like a... Um, a lodge, something that they would sleep in. They were wedged into their brains, and he said they couldn't get rid of these evil thoughts. They were just stuck in their minds. They were blocking their thoughts of goodness. They were blocking any penetrating thing that God could have come inside them because they let these thoughts take over their minds. You know, we have it where the Bible says, you know, that we are supposed to take every thought captive. You know, we might have a temptation where this thought comes into our mind, you know, maybe an evil thought, a horrific thought that we shouldn't be thinking. But that's not sin. It's not sin until we let it lodge, until we let it wedge into our mind. And here Jeremiah is telling them that they let these thoughts lodge in there. They were wedged in their mind where all their thoughts were evil. When God tells us that, that through him, we're supposed to take every thought captive under the obedience of Christ. Verse 15, he's talking about the armies that were already in the northern part, how we were talking about Dan. It's the northernmost city of Israel. And the invaders were coming, and they would come through the Golan Heights, the first place that they would also go through in Dan. They received words. You know, they didn't have the cell phones like we were talking about early, earlier as these guys were coming through Dan, but they tried to get word down. But by the time the word came down, they would already be on top of them. There was nothing that the people in Judah we're going to be able to do. And in verse 16, when he said, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that the watchers come from a far country. And it's this reason why there was that urgent appeal to truly repent, because God was telling them that judgment is coming, and they didn't listen. You know, how often do we, we get convicted by the Lord? He's telling us, you know, the things that, that we're doing, the things that we're walking in are not right. When we, we don't want to be like the people here in Judah, where they were hardening their heart. You know, when God comes and he speaks to our heart, we want to listen. We want to be softened to our heart to understand it so that we don't end up getting the judgment that could be coming towards us. In verse 19, he says, Oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? As Jeremiah was proclaiming this judgment that was coming, he's talking about this pain, this pain in his soul, his very heart. He had physical pain, stomach pain, issues, Stress, you know, stress causes pain. Here Jeremiah is worried about the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. You know, this was a prophet of God. He knew judgment was coming and there was watching the people. Nobody was repenting. Nobody was changing their ways. And he knows that God's judgment is coming soon. And it alarmed him. Jeremiah was in gut-wrenching agony because of the vision that the Lord has given him. You know, his country had walked away from God. They have chosen worthless idols to worship, and now doom was heading their way. And Jeremiah, as it says in 21, how long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? You know, how long is this destruction and plunder and invading army, how long is this going to last in our land? For he says in 22 that for my people are foolish. They have not known me. 
They are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. And God's looking down, and he's saying that my people, these are my people, and they're foolish. But he's still calling them my children. You know, even when we are foolish, even when we have hardened hearts, even when we are unobedient, he said that they are silly children, but they're mine, my children. You know, he is so generous that he still calls them his people. Even though we know the judgment that is coming, the foolishness that they had, you know, they were, they were wise, they were wise to do evil. But to do, do good, they had no knowledge. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be, to be a dumb criminal, and it's another thing to be a smart criminal. You know, now we have all of these videos that you could watch. They even had a TV show of, you know, the dumbest criminal doing all these dumb things. They go in to rob a convenience store or whatever. They get locked in or you watch them where they're falling through the ceiling and landing on, on all the racks. But, you know, it would be like somebody being dumb. You know, even a dumb guy can run into a bank and rob at a bank. But he's saying that these guys were wise to do evil. They had knowledge about it. You know, it would be like somebody, instead of going in and physically robbing a bank, getting on their computer and using their tech savvy to just drain all of the money from that bank without actually having to go inside. So he's like, you know, there's, there's one thing to be evil, but there's one thing to be wise in it. But they had no knowledge to do good. And in verse 23, he says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form, and it was void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. The point for Jerusalem and Judea was plain. But you know what? They served and they knew a God who created all things. He's reminding them of the beginning in Genesis where he said, you know, the world was out with, without form and void. And I created everything with the speak of my mouth. And here, they weren't remembering that. They weren't remembering what just a few hundred years ago when, when God led them into the promised land. They weren't rejoicing. They weren't paying attention to any of that. You know, and as they were doing that, it says, at the presence of the Lord, his fierce anger arose. In verse 27, he says, For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens be black, because I have spoken, I have proposed, and I will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee, and from the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen, they shall go into the thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. In verse 27, he's talking about the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end of it. God's going to bring his judgment on Judah. The land's going to be desolate, but it's not going to be wiped out completely. He promised that judgment would come, but he's going to save it so that that way they can return later. And in verse 29, he says, Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. God promised the judgment was coming. It was both inevitable, and it would be complete. There would be no cities holding against it or against the coming invaders. You know, we saw at the beginning where it says, you know, hurry and run to your fortified cities. He's like, no matter what city you go to, no matter how fortified it is, it's going to be taken over by the invaders. And in verse 30, he says, And when you are plundered, what are you going to do? Though you close yourself with chrism, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. For I have heard a voice of a woman in labor, the anguish of her who brings forth her first child, the voices of the daughter of Zylon, bewailing herself. She spreads her hand saying, woe is me now for my soul is weary before, because of murderers. No, he's saying that as these guys are coming in, are you going to, you know, doll yourself up, get all flirtatious with them? 
and try to appease your enemy, you know, as, as a woman going out to try to find a lover. But he's saying that they're going to despise you. Babylon's coming in, and no matter what kind of front you put on, they're still going to wipe you out. And he said in the last half of that, for I heard the voice of a woman in labor. Now, I haven't been, you know, this is Utah. Some of you guys have many kids. Some of you may not have any kids. But I have been in the delivery room with my wife when she gave birth to our son. And today we have modern medicine. You know, I'm watching her. She, she's in pain. And they, they ask, you know, would you like an epidural? You know, they come in there with this, like, four-foot-long needle that they poke right in your back, you know, but it alleviates the pain. And here Jeremiah is talking about, you know, all he could hear is like the sound of a wailing woman in childbirth. And I'm pretty sure that in Jeremiah's day, they didn't have epidural. They didn't have pain medicine. So like all of you women that have, have given birth or, you know, maybe you watch movies where they exaggerated a little bit, but you hear the yelling, the screaming, the failing of this pain that the ladies are going through in childbirth, this is what he's saying. You know what? You might forsake me and think that when Babylon comes in, you can get all prettied up and be flirtatious and try to be goody-goody with your enemy as they're coming in. But Jeremiah, like, I've heard this sound of a woman that's in labor, you know, getting ready to deliver her first child. And it's not a pretty sight, you know, that sound, that wailing that they're coming in And God's warning them. He's like, you know what? I've been giving you all these chances, and this is what's coming for you. Now we're going to flip into chapter 5. You know what? This one's a little bit more depressing than just the last one. But as we're going through these chapters of judgment, as we're going through this book of judgment in Jeremiah, there's always little nuggets of hope. We're always seeing where God is telling them, you know what? Destruction is coming, but... You know, just like our lives right now, you know, we may have things happening in our lives, but Jesus is there. Jesus is always should be our go-to. In verse 1, it says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see and know and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her, though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. You know, as we're reading this, it's, it's similar to just another verse that we read in Genesis. Here we saw when, when Abraham was told that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed. And he's saying, well, Lord, what if I find just 50 righteous people? What if I find 40 righteous people? What if I find 10? And here he's telling Jeremiah, run to and through for the streets and see if you can find anyone who executes judgment. Find anybody in this town that seeks the truth, not 10, not five, but anybody, just one, and I will pardon her. This is to give us an idea of how wicked, how evil God's chosen people were in the promised land. They're in the promised land, and they are worshiping idols. And God's saying, just find one. And he couldn't do it. And in verse three, it says, O Lord, are your eyes not on the truth? Have you stricken them? but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive corrections. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Just a few verses ago, we were talking about delivering a kid. And as I was reading this, it sounds like talking to a kid. You know, some kids listen real well, some doesn't. And this one is saying, you know, Have you stricken them, but they not grieve? Have you consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction? They have made their face harder than a rock. It's like having this little kid that you tell them, hey, don't do that, or you're going to get in trouble. What do they do? They do that. Maybe you give them a swat on the bottom. Maybe you put them in timeout. They come right out, and they do it again. And this is what God's saying about the people in Judah. You know, I've warned them. They've watched what happened to their, their brothers in Israel, those 10 tribes that were not obedient, they have already been wiped out. And, and Jeremiah and them, they're talking, you know, they don't repent. They've had this happen. They've been warned. And it's all together, it says at the end, that they burst their broken yoke and they burst their bonds. You know, they've done all of these wild things, but they are not listening 
to what God has for them. And in verse four, he says, therefore, I said, surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. And I will go to the great men and I will speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of the God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst their bonds. So now he's saying, okay, I've went through and through. So I'm going to go to the poor people. He's like, these people are uneducated. Maybe they don't know any better. That's why they're not following the way of the Lord. So I'm going to go in verse 5. He says, I'm going to go to the great men, the aristocrats, the smart people, and see maybe they know. But even with all their education, all their advantages, they would know the Lord. But searching through it, he found out that, you know, the uneducated, the poor the wise men of the town, none of them were following the Lord. So in verse 6, it says, Therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn to pieces because their transgressions are many. Their backsliding has increased. How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods when I have fed them to the fool. Then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were like a well-fed, lusty stallion, everyone nighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? In verse 6, he's talking about the lion again, a lion from the forest shall slay them. You know, we see the, the lion from before, but this time he's got the wolf and the leopard described with them. And here are pictures of the, the coming invaders that are going to be coming down to him. But we could also look at it that once you get wiped out, you know, when you take land that had people on it and then the people leave, you know, that wild animals come back. So this could be a picture of Babylon coming to destroy them. This could be after the destruction where the wild animals has come back to the land. But with all these things going on in verse 7, he says, how can I pardon your backsliding when you have forsaken me? You know, the people of Judah, they had sworn to idols. Even when they had been fed, they had been taking care of God, they decided to reject the one true God who walked with them and their forefather through the wilderness so that they could go to the idols. They were full of lust. They were looking at their neighbor's wife. They were chasing after their neighbor's wife. You know, last Last week, we talked about, you know, the different goddesses that they were choosing, the, the, the prostitution that they were going after, you know, not only their neighbor's wives, but they were doing it for worship and other stuff and their idolatry. Their idolatry was not just, you know, a spiritual, but it was also a physical adultery that they were doing. And in verse 9, it says, As Jeremiah searched Jerusalem, he found no righteous men or men of truth. He did not find spiritual rebels, but he found adulterers. And this nation was due for judgment from God because God is not one that would be mocked. So in verse 10, it says, go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make her a complete end. Take away her branches for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dwelt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he, neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. But the prophets become wind, for their word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. In those days, if you had destroyed walls, that means that you had no fortress, that you were wide open for attack. And that's what they were saying for God, you know, that, that Israel, that all of her walls were destroyed but do not be made to a complete end. So here he is giving them a little bit of hope. You guys are going to be destroyed, but not to a complete end. He's like, I'm going to take away your branches, for you have dealt treacherously with me. They have lied about the Lord. They had all these false prophets, all these false teachers that they were listening to, and Jeremiah was in competition. You know, here he is trying to tell everybody, hey, you need to repent. Jesus is coming back to bring judgment. God's coming back to bring judgment on our land because we have committed adultery against him. We're following all of these pagan idols 
and we're not turning back to them. We lied. They got these false prophets that are coming out there. No, we're in peace. We're in God's land. We don't have to worry about anything. It's all sunshine and rainbows here. But we get to verse 14, and it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and the people would, and it shall devour them. Behold, I bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men, and they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks and your herd. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. The Lord's telling Jeremiah that, you know, we got all these false prophets, that their word is like the wind. You know, they're speaking, but nothing's happening. They're promising all this peace, all this joy because of who we are and where we are. But God tells Jeremiah that I'm going to make your words like a fire, that you are going to devour them. You know, there's a difference between the false prophets and the, and the true prophets. You know, in the, in the later on in Ezekiel, we can see his actual action. You know, Jeremiah is just a bunch of words, but Ezekiel comes out and he brings out all these false prophets and he says, okay, maybe let's put all this stuff out here on the altar and we'll cry out to God and see what happens. And all of these false prophets, you know, they got their, 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 their sacrifice on the altar and they're crying out and nothing's happening. And Ezekiel kind of mocked them, you know, maybe he's sleeping, maybe your God can't hear. So, you know, they're doing all these different things, trying to get their attention and nothing happens. And Ezekiel, when it's his turn, he's like, you know what, let's pour all this fire right here. I mean, all this water on it. And then he cries out to God and this consuming fire comes down and takes them all. But here all Jeremiah had was his word. This young man's going in through the city and telling them to repent and they're not listening. Now he's telling them that judgment is coming, that this land from up north, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to come down and he's going to take your food, your food that goes to your family, he's going to take and they're going to consume. And then in verse 18 he says, but... Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. So again, he's telling him, I'm not going to make a complete end of you. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all of these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. So we got the positive news. You know, I'm not going to do a complete destruction of you. But then they're saying, you know, what, what am I supposed to say to him? And God gives Jeremiah a word that tells him that, you know what, you have forsaken me. You know, here you are in my land and you want to worship these idols. You want to do all these abominations, all these evil, wicked things in my land. And God gives us free will. And he said, you know what, if you want to worship these foreign gods, no problem. But you're going to do it somewhere else. You're not doing it at my house. You know, we read in Joshua where, where he says, you know, that we, we should choose. And Joshua says, you know, for me and my house, we're going to choose to serve the Lord. You know, we got to think about the things that are permitted in our homes. You know, are these things that, that God would permit? As we're reading the scriptures, the, either the things that we have on TV, the things that, that are said in our homes, you know, this is a house of the Lord. We want to make sure that, that our ha houses are respectful of the things of God. We don't want to be like the people in Judah. You know, it's so easy to think, well, I'm not in Judah. I don't have little, you know, idols that I'm worshiping and, you know, doing all these abominations with. But what is going on in our home? What is going on in our heart? You know, as, as God did with, with Pharaoh, he gave him the free will. He brought all these plagues against him, but God chose to harden his heart because of what Pharaoh wanted, a hard heart. And here, the people of Judah, they wanted to worship these foreign gods. So what does God say? All right, here you go. They're coming. They're taking you. You can go to the land of these foreign gods, but you're not doing it in my house. And in verse 20, it says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and not see? 
who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? Who have placed the sound, the sand as the bound of the sea and a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and a rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain both to the former and the latter. In this season, he reserves it for us to the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withered, have withheld good from you. So Jeremiah was given another decree to tell the people. He's like, oh, you foolish people. You have eyes, yet you don't see. You have ears, yet you don't hear. Like we can understand that from the idols that they created because they can make eyes and ears on them, but they don't hear or see. But we have eyes, we have ears. We can hear and see the goodness of what God has done. And God's saying, look, look at this creation. I know here in Utah, we don't have an ocean. You know, they got the, the Great Salt Lake, but that's not the same. But there's something special about going and sitting at the beach, you know, listening to the wind. I mean, to the, well, there's probably wind too, but listening to the waves as they're crashing on the sea, you know, preferably a warm beach. You know, you're out there hanging out, you're listening to the waves, you're watching it, and you're kind of in awe at the beauty of what God created. As far as your eyes can see, nothing but water and all of these waves crashing down on the beach. But if you were to look at that beach and you look at all that water, God's saying, look, you know, here all these waves are crashing down and they're stopping right here at the sand. You know, some beaches have cliffs and whatnot, but a lot of them you go, it's just a flat sand thing. This water comes crashing day in and day out, not going any further, not drawing back very much. But yet we look at the power of the ocean. I don't know if you guys have seen the videos of a tsunami or you know what a tsunami is, maybe you have an earthquake or something, and then the ocean becomes this raging force to be reckoned with. There was a tsunami in Japan in 2011. It was a great earthquake, and you watch the beach. When a tsunami comes, you see this water that, that's supposed to be stopped right here at the sand. It kind of draws back a bit, and as it's drawn back, then it comes in, and you watch these videos of this wave 16 feet high that just came through and just wiped out whole towns in Japan. You know, here God's saying, you know what, by a decree of my mouth, this water obeys. And you see when judgment or any other thing comes that we're in a fallen world now that what this actual ocean can do, it comes through and wash through, wipe out cities, wipe out towns. And he's like, you know, you people have eyes, you have ears, you can see my glory and my creation Yet you choose to ignore me. You choose to turn away from me to create little gods that, you know, they have no eyes. They have no mouth. They can't talk to you. They can't do anything. So he said in verse 26, so from among my people are found wicked men. These are my people and they're all wicked. They lie in wait as one that sets snares. They set traps. They catch men. A cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. They have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat, they are sleek, yet they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause. They cause the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. The right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such nations as this? You know, we look around today, you know, even good people, wicked people, a lot of people prosper in this life, but this is God's people. He says, you know, they're prospering, but they're not doing what I asked. You know, they're not taking care of the widows. They're not taking care of the fatherless. And what should I do about it? It says, shall I not avenge myself on a nation of this? These are, these are my people. They should know better. And then in verse 30, he says, so astonishingly and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in end? Man, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. To hear God saying that about his land, about his people. 
You know, these were strong words and they were introducing something truly horrible that were in the eyes of God. You know, we're not to take the Lord's name in vain. We're not to speak falsely representing him. And the first thing that, that he said that happened were the, the false words of these pretended pro- prophets, that they were claiming peace. They were claiming to claim things in the name of the Lord, but they spoke falsely. The second astonishing and horrible thing that were the, the leaders among God's people, the rulers of that time, you know, they weren't led by love or leadership or led by God, but by their own power. You know, they were craving their own authority and their leadership was from man and not God. And the third astonishing and horrible thing that, that was happening in God's people is that they were perfectly happy having false prophets and wicked leaders. You know, we see it today, you know, popularity among God people is never supposed to be regarded as a guarantee that this person is a prophet of God. You know, we see what, what Paul said in Acts 17 that, you know, you may have this popular preacher preaching all these feel-good messages, but he says, you know what, test it against the scriptures. Are their words lining up with God words? Because if they're not, the same thing will happen to us as it happened to those people, that it said disasters will come upon them and those false prophets and corrupt leaders will be no help to them. So, you know, we need to check our hearts. You know, as we're going through this book, you know, there's a lot of dark, heavy stuff reading about judgment coming. We look at our world today. We look at, at our country. Are we turning our back on God? Are we turning to little idols? You know, we have eyes, we have ears. We can see what is going on in our world today. And as we look at God's word and trust in his promises, you know, we have hope. Just like Jeremiah was leaving a little bit of hope for the people of Judah that, yeah, dark times are coming, but guess what? I'm gonna bring you back. I'm gonna restore you into the land the day that, that you repent and come back to me. And we've seen that. We've seen Israel come to back together, not in two separate lands, but in one nation. We've seen the promises that, that Jesus talked about through the gospels, knowing that God is coming back. You know, there are people be saying that, yeah, but it's been so long. You know, God is patient. You know, if he were to come back five years ago, how many of you would say that, you know what, I would have been saved. I would be in the presence of the Lord. You know, he's not in any hurry for judgment. As we're reading through Jeremiah, and next week I got you guys something printed out. I'll give it to you, a little timeline of the book of Jeremiah. We see that, you know, it's been over 40 years that he's out here preaching and talking to him, you know, when the judgment comes. Even when they're in exile, he's still preaching the good news to them. So we need to check our hearts. Make sure they're not follow ground. Make sure they're not hardened. You know, there's a lot of stuff in this world to draw us away from God. There's a lot of things that we could see on the news with the elections coming up and the different things going on that, that can harden our heart towards other people. But as he said at the end, you know, my people had all of this stuff, but they weren't using it for the fatherless. They weren't using it to help others. You know, if you guys feel that, that joy, I, I want to do something to help people, um, come out on tomorrow night. You know, what a great night to soften your heart, to see people that, that are truly hurting, and you can come out there and pray with them and serve them. There's no other joy that we get from the Lord than serving others. So I just want to pray for you guys before we leave and just encourage you to have God seek your heart. Find out what's in your heart. Is it hard ground? Is it hollow ground? How can I make it where it's going to be ground that lets the good soil permeate in there? So, Father, we do come before you today thanking you for your word. Lord, how much better it would be to come up here, Lord, just happy and joyful and cheerful, sharing about all of the great things that Jesus was walking, healing people, Lord, and, and people who are coming to Christ, the great revivals, when here we have Jeremiah, Lord, this young man that you called to go and speak to your people, Lord, to repent, to turn to you. Father, but we see your goodness during this time. We see over and over, Lord, you encouraging not only your prophet, Lord, but your people, that even though they may go through hard times, Lord, that they can turn to you, Father, and you'll walk with them. And Lord, that's my prayer tonight, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, Lord, if we're in the 
the happy, joyful times, or Lord, if we're in the middle of that valley in that, in that hard times, Lord, we trust that you will walk with us. God, I pray that you just go out with us this week. Lord, that you search our hearts. Lord, that they will be soft. Lord, that the soil of our hearts will be ready for your word to produce good fruit in our lives. Lord, let us go out and serve and love one another as you have called us to do. And Lord, let us speak truth. God, we see Jeremiah speaking hard truth. We see Jesus coming in speaking hard truth. But Lord, we see it done in love. So God, I pray that you just be with us and guide us and give us wisdom and discernment in all things that we do, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.